I'll, I'll be happy to take questions or comments. Uh, Minister Simeon uh, Bennett from Bloomberg, can I just confirm or clarify whether you are actually saying that uh, Singapore now has community spread of H1N1 or are you still saying that there are signs of community spread emerging? I think the signs are very prominent now. So obviously there's community spread. The, the depends on how you define community spread. You can define very narrowly, and, and in which case, uh, you know, so, so you can define widely. But as far as I'm concerned, there are now local transmission, and uh, all cases are not all imported. And that's why I, I talk about the proportion of uh, local transmission trans, uh, cases to imported cases. And if you look at the last two, three days, the figures suggest to me like something like maybe 40% are now locally transmitted. And uh, if you look at the experience of Japan, North America definitely, and uh, Australia, one should expect the 40% to become 50%. <laughs> that means one to one and then 60%, and then it will be just, you know, really... W so I think community spread is characterized by... I explained this a few uh, press conferences ago, wildfire. I would say the Victorian Melbourne particular experience was a wildfire scenario. So a case has, must have been wandering about, and it just the fire just broke. And the only way is to wait until the, the fire burns itself out. And that's why within a week or two, the figures, at least reported cases, soared to about 1,000. And what we are trying to do with control measures is to slow it down so that hopefully it is a slow burn. The final outcome may still be the same, meaning the, most of us will get infected for the simple reason that the virus is new. So we don't have, or at least most people in this room don't have. I may have because I'm above 55 years old from some previous uh, protection, I think. But most people would not have protection. And therefore, you need one case, get in touch with you, and that's it. You'll get it. So, so that, that is how, how this uh, virus uh, 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 characterized, you know. But... But there's advantage in slowing down to a slow burn because if you look at New York, because as I explained just now, Australia, uh, U.S. did not have a chance to contain the outbreak. It just went into uh, wildfire very quickly. And uh, the New York public hospitals emergency rooms, a big surge, five times the usual number of E&E &E attendances. So the hospitals will be overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is not just inconvenience or waiting. Our fear is always that we know that this uh, virus ha is of risk to certain high-risk group. And if you are overwhelmed, your ability to focus on the high-risk group may be compromised. And that's when you may get into trouble. I suspect in Mexico case, it was just an overwhelmed hospital health care system. And that's why their case fatality rate is so much higher. To be fair to them, because they were the ground zero, so they, 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 they don't have opportunity to, to prep themselves up. And I think that is what we should try to avoid. So slow burn has an important public health significance and is something we would try to achieve. We cannot guarantee that outcome, but we will try. And, and countries like Japan, like Victoria, tried but failed. But I don't think we should just give up so quickly. And, and, and that's the reason why the switch from containment to mitigation should not be an abrupt switch. We will try to contain as long as we can contain it, as long as resources allow us to contain it. But if the number of new cases begin to look like largely local transmission, then you know that containment measures are becoming less and less useful. So it's about risk management here. I might just ask a follow-up question about the alert level, because um, mm. I, was, I was looking at your alert levels on the um, internet, and 
really it seems, that according to your criteria, that you're, you're closer to being in alert level red mm-hmm. because the definitions for that are WHO has declared a pandemic, mm-hmm. Singapore is affected, there's a higher risk of acquiring the disease mm-hmm. from the community once the pandemic spreads to Singapore and that the strategy is to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Now, that all sounds like the situation that yeah. we're in now, yeah. so I'm just wondering why you haven't gone to mm-hmm. alert level red and instead you've created this new sure. alert level. I think those... Those were the days when we designed alert levels biased by SARS experience. We just assumed that every pandemic will be severe, like SARS, with very high case fatality rate. Very few of us put our mind to thinking about that there may be pandemic which are mild, like this one. So, so the alert levels were biased by that, but the last uh, two months allow us to understand this virus better, and when everybody knows that, in fact, this fatality rate is quite different from SARS or what we fear most, which is the Spanish flu of 1918 type. So we begin to, to, to re-characterize our alert level. So yellow is the correct level for Singapore. In fact, I would was, I was describe practically every country, their control measures today are all on yellow. Yeah. Orange will be the right level if the virus really begins to mutate and begin to inflict very high case fatality rate of the type that we thought would be similar to SARS or similar to 1918 flu or similar to the feared bird flu. Yeah. But I think uh, Singaporeans should not get away thinking that yellow is 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 very low level containment. It is not yellow. I think, as I stressed before, is not green. Yellow is not green. Yellow still re- means very high level of uh, vigilance and inconvenience, whether it is for patients who have visitors in hospitals or the need for quarantine as and when cases crop up. <coughs> yes, Sama. Uh, Sal Makalik, The Straits Times. Mr. Cole, two questions. Mm. You mentioned a tipping point mm. and that we are not there yet. Yeah. What would that tipping point be? And then question two, uh, case fatality right now for this H1N1 is 0.37. What, how does that compare to normal flu? Mm. I, I would say we have crossed the tipping point of community spread. The, I think typically uh, we our rule of thumb is once the... Uh, local transmission figures cross the 10%. We know that you know, it is very hard because the, the, it, it's quite exponential after that. One will spread to two and, and two spread to four or five. So I would say we have already crossed that tipping point. But when, whether the uh, transmission is sustained in a big scale or not, and that's subjective. But regardless, I think it points a certain direction to us that it is irreversible, that you will have to move into mitigation. It's a question of time. And, and the reasoning for doing so is we could easily just switch to mitigation tomorrow and ask everybody to go and visit PPCs instead of coming to hospitals. But I thought it is still useful to try to control as long as we can so as to minimize the workload on the hospitals and really, the main purpose is to try to achieve a slow burn scenario that I painted just now. The, uh, what was your second one? Ah, case with it. Seasonal flu is about uh, point one. Huh? Point one. Point one. Yeah. And uh, yes and no, because, because the figures are skewed in a sense. These are New York data, these are US data. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I remember reading somewhere that that once they went into wildfire, they already said, you know, they no longer check for take blood tests, so, so except for the high risk. So they focus on high risk groups. So it's a skilled population. Yeah. So out of the skilled population, you should, one should expect higher case fatality rate. So the true case fatality rate, we, we, we won't know. There are many experts who thought that uh, this particular H1N1 looks more like the the H- Asian flu huh? of uh, 1957, yeah, which is uh, which still kills quite a number of people. So, so I think it is something that we should not take it too easy. 
particularly for high risk uh, population. So I think one should begin to be much more sophisticated in looking at case fatality that we should not be looking at case fatality for the general population. We should really be looking at age specific case fatality. That for young people, the case fatality is unduly high. For pregnant women, the case fatality rate is unduly high compared to seasonal flu. But for the other, the rest of the population, without other underlying medical conditions, well, it does seem like a seasonal flu phenomenon. Minister, uh, no point from Reuters. I have a question regarding the vaccine uh, supplies. Yeah. Yeah. How much have you planned to spend uh, on this with the current uh, manufacturer that you're talking about here? Mm. And who are, uh, how much more do you plan to spend for the other vaccine manufacturers that you're trying to diversify? We will get enough for the bulk of the population. The, uh, as I explained just now, that I, we see some value in having a, uh, a mixture of vaccines because, because all the vaccines uh, that have been named so far are not identical. So there are, there are, there are you know, so different manufacturers have different ways of doing it. And honestly, we're talking about something which we have not even seen yet. <laughs> so it's, it's theoretical and we do not know which will work better and for immediately is we also don't know who will deliver faster. So I think we will end up uh, buying a mixture and of different order sizes. Can you give so, up the names of the manufacturers? That you uh, no, we, we are still in, in, uh, in very close negotiations with them. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, my name is So from Wampao. Yep. Uh, Minister, this report regarding the uh, PPC, the flu uh, clinic, um, may I ask how uh, this clinic are uh, chosen? And uh, if the general public were to choose to go to this flu clinic, uh, are they expect to pay the normal GP rate or subsidized rate? The PPCs, uh, we need them in large numbers because it uh, depends on, on the assumption how uh, quickly the, the committee spread becomes. And, uh, and that's why we are staring at the need for quite a few hundred PPCs. So we, we invited uh, the GPs to take part, and uh, we were very happy with the response from there. And, but from MOH level, we, all, we have to take into account uh, uh, geographical spread. We want to make sure that PPCs are well located in all the housing estates so that it's convenient for most people. So, but once you end up with a few hundred uh, PPCs, I think we should be able to achieve such an outcome. And, but, so that's the that's first stage. The second stage is then to prepare them up so that they know what to do and how to deal with this. As to charging, we will just, it will be like normal, normal patients uh, and uh, we will provide the PPCs with PPEs which we subsidize and we will provide uh, access to Tamiflu or Relenza if necessary. And uh, I think so far in all our outbreak, patients will pay. And of course, those who have difficulty paying, then we separately look after them uh, if, if they are, have real financial needs. Um, Minister Kho, I'm Jessica yeah. from Straits Times. I have a mm -hmm. follow-up to that. Um, is there a time frame you're looking at to equip all clinics uh, with PPE? It may not be necessary because we don't need all the 2,000 clinics to be... We don't need 2,000 PPCs. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we need a few hundreds, so so that is what what we will do. The rest of the of the GPs will be they carry on life as usual because there will be other patients who are non flus and so on. And and our advice to all GPs, and in fact our advice to uh, TCM physicians as well, is that they must have their own uh, stock of PPEs to protect themselves uh, in a in an outbreak like this. Um, Dawn from the Straits Time. Uh, Dawn from my paper. Sorry, can we get um, a you? time sorry. frame? Sorry, <coughs> sorry, sorry. Can we get a time frame on when uh, you think the vaccine will be available? And again, the amount that uh, the, you are willing to spend. The vaccine manufacturers all have a lot of claims on when they can deliver. <laughs> but as I said, producing a vaccine is one thing. Producing a vaccine and be sure that they are safe to be used for masses. That's a different story. 
And we know that all drugs, including vaccines, because you are injecting something into healthy people, you want to be sure that it is safe. And secondly, in this case, it will be effective. And you need a lot of clinical trials. So those are the stumbling block, as far as I'm concerned. Rather than the, uh, you know, the seed virus are not <coughs> available and people are testing it out, but to ensure that the, the product is safe to be used. So most governments, I think, including Singapore, will probably end up as an insurance policy. We will, we will stock up some, and whether you will actually begin to put vaccine into people's body, we, we take it as a, sec as a second order decision, you know, subject to clinical trial results.